First Timothy chapter number six. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, uh, choir, for those songs. I think that was for me, brother. So God uh, must have had me in mind. I needed that. I needed that. I needed that uh, encouragement. Um, sometimes we're waiting on joy. We're, we're, we're looking to, you know, hoping to, to get it, but we've already got it. And sometimes it's just a matter of what we're focused on, you know. We think it's over there, we think it's there or here, but really it's right here as a Christian because we're redeemed. You know, he's already fought the fight and he's already won it and, you know, we have something to be joyful about today. So there's Kayla back there with the new baby. I know Linda's proud. She's proud that Miss Reagan is here today. Is this the first time y'all have been here? Okay. I was gone last week. Uh, I went on a mission trip. Y'all didn't know that, did you? I went on a mission trip to Dallas, Texas. Something I've always wanted to do, and I got to do it. I got, I got to go watch the Cowboys play last week. So I know y'all feel sorry for me, right? You Panthers fans out there are thinking, man, you're from North Carolina. What in the world? Is, why are you a Cowboys fan? I don't know, but what you don't realize is I'm, I'm so old now. We didn't have the Panthers when I was growing up. And the Cowboys were always on TV, and, you know, you had the Redskins as an option, but who would want to cheer for the Redskins, you know? <laughs> I had to hit Paul right there real quick. Uh, but anyway, um, I had a good time hanging out with Luke, and uh, we enjoyed our trip. Um, so I appreciated the opportunity to be away just a bit. Um, but I'm glad to be here with y'all today, and I'm always glad to share a word because I know God has somebody in mind today. And uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, here's what I believe God wants to, to challenge us on today. Okay, you ready? Let's just get to the point. Teenagers, listen, because this is, this is for you, it's for everybody here, but uh, uh, I really think this will be of great benefit to you. God wants to challenge us today. Uh, in regards to our passion. He wants to challenge us in really considering what it is that we're consumed with, that we're pursuing. What is your, your passion? He wants you to really evaluate that in, in light of what he desires for your passion to be. Okay, so in other words, what are you consumed with? What is your passion versus okay does it really line up with what God desires my passion to be okay so that's what he wants to challenge us with today because what I believe he wants to show us is his formula for success so if you're one of those that's looking for a title today's title is God's formula for success and we find that formula in first Timothy chapter 6 verse 6 so go ahead and look at that verse with me and uh, then we'll just go back and read the context, but I want you to get the formula first, okay? First Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, everybody tuned in. Um, matter of fact, if you will, uh, I realize some of you have great minds and, and you never forget anything, but if you do have a tendency to forget, then I'm really challenging you to pull out a piece of paper. You can take the back of your bulletin, and right now, if you don't have anything to write on, uh, there's some men back there that I know there's some bulletins. So if you don't have anything to write on, raise your hand, and I'll see that they get you a bulletin. If you don't have a pen, I'll make sure you get one, okay? I'm going to throw you one from up here. But I really want you to write down this formula, okay, because it comes directly out of the Word of God to you today, all right? So here it is. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, there's another translation I read this week. It's called the New Living Translation, not the New or not the Living Bible. The, Bi the, New, the Living Bible is a paraphrase, but the New Living translates a translation, and it actually says, "Godliness with contentment is great wealth." Okay, so here's your formula. Write it down. Godliness. Plus contentment equals success 
in the eyes of God. You got to write that down. Because I believe the enemy is constantly, young people, listen, he is bombarding you with a different form of success. In other words, for you young people, teenagers, success might be having a boyfriend or having a girlfriend because everybody else has one and I may not have one. So really, for me to truly be a success in the eyes of my peers, it would mean for me to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Am I right or wrong, teenagers? Right? Yes, yes, no, I'm not there. Okay, so I know it's something you, you guys deal with. Um, or, or not only that, it might be in the area of, for young people in your academics, it might be in the area of athletics. I don't know what it is. It may be in the area of what you look like. You know what I'm saying? Because the world is constantly saying, in order to be success, you got to look this way. In order to be a success, you got to have this level of grades, or you got to be this level of, of, of player on the field at this thing. You know, you see what I'm saying? And so in the eyes of the world, success is something a lot different than the way God is seeing it, okay? But God sees success as godliness plus contentment. That's success in the eyes of God. So let's go back and read, beginning at verse 3. And let's kind of see the context. So there'll be one more message from this series in 1 Timothy next week. We'll conclude, but there really has to be two in 1 Timothy chapter 6. But I really feel like the heartbeat of it is found in verse 6. But let's start there, verse 3. It says, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words... Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and of the doctrine which accords with godliness, then he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reveling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. Now look at verse 7. For we brought nothing into the world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. You see, here's why God wants you to evaluate your passion and what you're consumed with. Because some of us get so consumed and so passionate about things that really in the end we're not taking any of that with us. You get it? And there's a lot of things we're passionate about and consumed with that really in the end when you breathe your last breath in this life, it's not going to matter there. So God wants you to be consumed with something that is going to make life better for you, but more importantly, make life better for the people that are around you. Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus make life better for people? For anybody that would open themselves up, did Jesus make life better for them? Absolutely. God doesn't want anything less from his children. It's not just about your happiness. It's about God doing such a work in your life and in your heart that that begins to spill over into the lives of the people that are around you. You got it? But again, so many times we get consumed with things that really are not going to make a difference in eternity. But here's what he says in verse 8. He says, having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Verse 10, for the love of money... Notice that it does not say money. It says the love of money. So it would be that passionate pursuit. It would be the life that is consumed with nothing more than getting more and more and more of physical wealth. Okay? That's, that's, so, so he's saying the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So with that context in mind, I want to talk to you about God's formula for success. God's formula for success. The first thing I want to ask about verse 6 is I want to ask the question, what 
is godliness. Because if, you're, if you've written that formula down, then you're looking at the first part of it, and maybe you're thinking, well, what is godliness? Because I would say that's the thing that God wants you to get consumed with. Did you hear what I just said? Young people, all of you, this is the thing God wants you to be consumed with. In other words, everything else in your life, God wants to be secondary compared to the pursuit of godliness. All right? So what is godliness? Well, when we were looking at chapter 4, go back to chapter 4. Here's what we're told in verse 7. Paul told Timothy, he said in chapter 4, verse 7, reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. Exercise yourself toward godliness. So what is godliness? What am I supposed to be exercising or training myself towards? What is godliness? Well, one of the ways that I like to put it is it's godlikeness. It's godlikeness. I'm exercising myself toward being like God, toward speaking like God, toward responding like God, to acting like God. This is what I'm learning to train myself to do. I'm learning to live out of the spirit life instead of the, the old fleshly life, you know, that wanted to handle everything in its own power, in its own wisdom, in its own ways. I'm learning to live out of the spirit and out of the ways that God wants me to live. And so when I do that, what is happening my life is putting forth God-likeness. Is everybody following me with that? I mean, when I trust God, and I hear God say, I want you to say this. When I hear God say, I want you to respond this way. Or when I hear God say, I want you to act this way, and I do choose to respond that way, then what the world is getting to see is the invisible God through my life. What a privilege. We are making, write this down, we are making, we have the privilege to make visible what is invisible. Does anybody see God right now? Does anybody see him? I don't see him. But I have the opportunity to see him as I interact with you as a believer. Why? Why is that? Because God says that he lives in his people. God says he lives in his people. And so I have the opportunity when I'm around you or if you're around me to literally see what's invisible. I get to see it visible as I hang out with you. That's, that's the opportunity we have in the world. So do you see why God wants you to be consumed with that? He wants the world to know him. He wants the world to know what he's like. And he has chosen to do that very thing through his people. That's what he wants us to be consumed with. I take you back to the tragedy of the fall in Genesis chapter 3. When God created man, he created him in his own image. He breathed life, his life, into man. Chapter 3, what happens? Man forfeits that life. And when he forfeits that life, he forfeits the opportunity that he has to live in the image of God. Because if you don't have the life of God, you can't make visible what's invisible. So now you understand the gospel message that begins with Abraham, according to Paul, that is constantly pointing to the day when God is going to restore the opportunity for man to once again enjoy the life of God inside of him. Do you realize that's what being a Christian is all about? It's about receiving the life of God inside of you and now being able to do what you were created to do, and that is make visible what is invisible. You know, man tried to do that under the law, but he couldn't do it. <laughs> he couldn't do it. That's why the new is something so much better. That's what Jesus, why Jesus, what he ushered in into the world, the new covenant life and the spirits, why it's so much better. Because now you can do what you were created to do. And that is to live in the image of God. You can be godly. Because think about it, who's the only one that can, can be godly? Well, it's God himself.
I mean, because what is godliness? Where does it come from? Godliness comes from God. So for you as a believer, you've got to understand the potential that you have to live a godly life in this world, and you have to embrace, because, see, there's a misunderstanding about what godliness is, because some people will define godliness as somebody who goes to church every week, you know, somebody who, who, who prays a really nice, beautiful prayer, or somebody who's, who's always given here, or who's always doing this, or doing all those things, but you've got to understand at the heart of godliness is, is, is living like God. It's having the same character as God would have. It's speaking his words. It's acting and responding in the way that he would have us to respond. And all the while, according to Romans 8, 28, God's desire is to conform us into the image of Christ. Because Jesus himself said that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so in in other words, what Jesus was saying is the whole time I've been living among you, what I've been doing is showing you what God is like. Do you realize that you have the opportunity every day to show the people at your job, to show your family, to show the people in your school what God is like? And all it requires is faith. Can I get an amen? I mean, really, that's your effort, praise God. It's just to believe. Okay, God, I know everything within me just wants to let this guy have it or let this person have it, but you're saying, hey, be kind, you know? Give my enemy something to drink. Give them something to eat. I'm just going to trust you. And when I do trust God and I act on that truth, then I'm showing the world what God is like. That's what God wants you to get consumed with. Because godliness means you're going to be a source of life for the people that are around you. So what is contentment? Well, you know what contentment is, right? That's pretty simple. It means to be satisfied. You know what I have? I just have this picture. I don't have a lazy boy at my house. But I just have this picture of a man who has just eaten his favorite meal. (laughs) You know, when I think about contentment, I just see this guy who's just eaten his favorite meal. He's not only gotten his favorite meal, but he's just eaten his favorite dessert. He's, He's literally stuffed. He cannot put one more bite in. And what I see is a man who goes over, and it's funny because when I went to to Dallas this past weekend, I guess one of the the highlights was getting the opportunity to be around a friend of mine that was really my best friend in seminary. I got to stay with him and his family for three days. My wife knows him really well. He spent the night with us a lot when he was still single when we were at seminary. One of my best friends, he's an awesome guy, and I love him to death. And so getting the opportunity to hang out with him. And so what's so funny is you don't know him, so I can use him as an example, is I'm seeing my buddy Tommy right now. Because every night we were there, I could just tell the, 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 the best thing that he liked to do was, uh, matter of fact, one night his wife fed us lasagna. It was top notch. We ate these brownies that were topped with this chocolate and this whipped cream and ice cream on the side. And it was just awesome. And I just, I just see Tommy getting in his, what he called his fat clothes. That's what he said. He said, I'm getting in my fat clothes. And he goes over there and he gets in his lazy boy and he lays back and he pulls his blanket and his iPad over there beside him and he flips on the TV, you know? That's what I think. That's what I see when I think about contentment. I just think satisfied. So when you take the pursuit of godliness and you add to that somebody who is completely content with showing the world what God is like, then here's what God is saying. Then you found what true wealth is all about. You found it. That's what it means to be wealthy. Now how many of us, with every commercial, with everything that we're seeing, and everything that we're being told, how many of us are hearing that message? No, what we're hearing is, well, it's about more money it's about more things it's about looking a certain way it's about this it's about that this is what success truly is 
Sorry, y'all. That's not how God sees it. Because literally, if you think about it, Jesus Christ, from the world's perspective, was one of the greatest failures to ever live. I mean, you show up and you help all those people, and then doggone it, in the end, you end up getting yourself killed. What a sad story. Uh, well, sorry, it wasn't about me getting myself killed. It was about me laying down my life. It was about me building a bridge between what was holy and what was not holy. It was about me laying down that life and reconciling God and man back together in a right relationship. It wasn't about failure because literally the cross was the greatest victory and the greatest success that anyone has ever known because I'm going to tell you what the cross says about God. Let me tell you what the cross says about God and what Jesus revealed to the world. Jesus showed the world that God loves the world. Who else would give their only son to die so that others could have life and benefit and be blessed? Don't you want to show the world that God loves the world? Don't you want the world to see that? You have that opportunity. But you're never going to do it if you keep believing that the enemy, what he's telling you about what genuine success is. And see, I can talk about this because I live it every day. I got kids. Parents, you're there. I, I know what the world says and what it views as a successful parent. Your kids have to do this. They have to do that. They have to, you know, or else we feel like well, we'd really accomplish anything. I know what it's like to be challenged and tempted in those areas. So to be content means to be satisfied. And to be satisfied knowing there is no greater pursuit. Why? Because look at verse 7. We brought nothing into the world. And it is certain that we're not going to take anything out. Now in the context, if you read it carefully and you read throughout chapter 6, he's talking specifically about money and about worldly wealth. So I want to ask you a question. I wonder what is really behind a lot of the evil that's going on in the world. You think it might be a little bit of greediness behind that? You think there might be a little bit of greed underneath all of this junk that's going on that we're seeing? Maybe, just maybe. There's a lot of greed killing families. There's a lot of greed that's killing killing relationships between husbands and wives and husbands and their kids and mamas and their kids. There's a lot of greed that's destroying a lot of things. And the sad part is a lot of times we don't see it. And see, it doesn't just have to be greed for, for physical money, dollars. It could be greed to look like a success or to follow a certain path that makes us look successful in the eyes of man. I, I get, I'm going to explain this in my point of view. I know how to fill these pews. I know how to do it. I know how to do it. I've already been there, already done it. But you know what? What matters to me now in this life more than filling these pews is you. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. That's what matters more to me than anything else. It's seeing you grow up, seeing you leave this building and become the source of God, life that God longs for you to be. Because look around. I don't, I, it doesn't, it, regardless of the empty pews, what I see is the potential to change the world. I do. I see it. I see the potential. And it doesn't matter whether I see it or not. God sees it. So I've kind of learned that a big part of my success on a spiritual level depends on if, whether or not I'm going to see things like God does or not. And one of the things he's challenging us to do is to begin to see success in the way that he does. And here's what he says. Godliness, the pursuit to show the world what I'm like, added with contentment, equals great wealth. That's how God sees it. So I want to ask you this morning, what is the enemy 
convincing you about success. Or, or can you join me today in realizing you're already a success? That you're already equipped for success because you have God. You don't need anything else. And to just understand that as I learn to cooperate with Him, seek Him, cooperate with Him, then literally each day of my life, as I trust, with him, trust Him, then I am going to be showing others what He is really like. And you know what? There's no way to improve on that. There's not. I mean, think about it. I'm speaking the words that God wants me to say. I'm responding in the way that God wants me to respond. I'm acting in a way that God wants me to act. You see why God wants you to be consumed with godliness and to be content with that? So think about the ways that the enemy's robbing you of being content. So what's he, what's he putting out there in front of you that's keeping you from being content? I'm not, I'm not saying we can't do anything else or we can't strive to be this or that. It's just that everything, God's wanting it all to be secondary underneath the pursuit of godliness. Everything else, secondary. So here's the challenge for you and for me. And I'm dealing with it. I'm dealing with it. But here's the challenge. The challenge is, well, God, okay, if I'm looking at success differently than what you are, then what I've got to do simply is I've got to stop believing the lie and I've got to accept what you say so very clearly in your word about success. That's it. You know what that's called at the end of the day? It's called repentance. <laughs> That's what repentance is. It means I'm changing my mind. I'm going to stop letting the enemy continue to lead me down this road where I'm constantly consumed and passionate about this because really in the end, what am I going to gain? So that's the biggest challenge, I think, before us. And I think it's for somebody, maybe for a couple, I don't know. But the enemy's kind of got you on this, this trail where he's got this carrot kind of dangling in front of you. And it's almost like just as you reach out and you think you're going to lay hold, he yanks it back. And he just continues dragging you down all these endless pursuits of all these different things. You know, and the problem is this, is that he's keeping you from enjoying what God's given you the privilege to enjoy. And that's showing others what he's like. And giving people an opportunity to say, you know, man, I want to I wanna know God. I want to be a part of what you're a part of. I want to I wanna have a relationship. And that leads me to the second question is, what kind of relationship do you have today with God? I mean, my wife and I were talking about it this morning. I mean, the last thing that I want for my kids is for them to always talk about their relationship with God in the past tense. In other words, I don't want them that all they can say is, well, I got saved at such and such, you know? Such as, I mean, that's great, but I want them to be able to talk about God in the present. In other words, yeah, it was back then when I started my relationship with God, but here's what God's doing right now in my life. Here's what God's doing through my life. Here's what God's changing about me. This is what's happening today. And so I don't ask that question to condemn you. I ask that question to challenge you. Because there's not anything any more important than that. There's nothing more important. So maybe your response this morning is just as simple as, you know, God, I don't want my relationship to be in the past tense. I want it to be now. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open my heart up and I'm going to say, okay, God, I don't want to miss it. We got to start somewhere. So we're going to start today. 
And I want to enjoy everything it is that you have for me in this life. I want you to be able to do everything that you want to do through my life. I want to be a person who shows others what you are truly like in this world. Because would, would you not agree with me, church, that when you look around and you watch the news and you see all the different things that are happening, all the different things that are said and how people handle this and handle that, would you not agree that at the end of the day the world just needs Jesus? Amen? I mean, can the church agree on that? So it's like, you know, sometimes I think we look at it, we're like, oh, I can't make a difference. But yeah, you can. Because I would argue that if you can go out of this life having made a difference in one person, that's pretty valuable. Would you not agree? Because I can guarantee you if that one person that you impact gets a hold of the true Jesus, then God's going to do a work through them for somebody else somewhere along the line. So what about your relationship with God today? You know what? I cannot assume that everybody in this room even has a relationship with God. You know, because that has to start somewhere, according to the Bible. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that everybody would be saved. No, that's not what it says. Is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would what? Believe would not perish, but have everlasting life. So the only way you can begin the relationship is to believe the gospel. To believe on Jesus. And to believe he is the way, the truth, and the life. See, that's it. He was God's way of making it all right. And so in order to enjoy that relationship, I got to believe in him. And I got to believe on what he did to make it right. And that's where it starts. And that's only the beginning. It's only the beginning. Father, we thank you for this day and thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the clarity in which you have spoken to our hearts today. Uh, the clarity in which you have made known how you view success. And God, I, I, there's no doubt that, that, that there's some here today or someone here today who has allowed the enemy to confuse this and to convince them that really what they need to pursue is this or that. And so the enemy has gotten us off track and, and led us to believe that there's something better than pursuing godliness and pursuing a life of showing others what you're truly like to pursuing a deeper and more intimate relationship with you. God, only you and only your spirit can open the eyes of our, of our spirit heart. Only you can do that. So, Lord, I'm just believing that you had this to say today. And, Lord, there's somebody out there right now who's already received it. They've already taken it in and they've already opened their heart and they're breathing a sigh of relief, Lord, in what you're doing in their life and your goodness to be patient and reach out to them and your faithfulness. Lord, we just thank you for that. Thank you for that. God, don't let, don't let us allow the enemy to convince us of something lesser. Don't let him get us on this pursuit that, Lord, when we leave this world, we're empty-handed, you know, because we've, we've sought the things of the world instead of the things of God. So, Father, thank you again. We love you. We always appreciate you reaching out to us and, uh, and continuing to Put the truth in front of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.